Okay. All right. So it seems like we got everything set up. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first Badger Crop Connect of the season of the year, I believe. Um, so today I was asked to share with you some thoughts on soil management in the spring. So these comments are mainly going to be related to uh, soil temperature and um, sorry, I'm trying to move my, there we go. Um, soil temperature and moisture. And so why do we worry about these is because uh, we know that soil temperature affects when we plant. Uh, it affects how the seed grows and it also affects microbial activity in the soil and therefore uh, nutrient availability for your plants. And with the moisture, or also sometimes we refer to that as soil water content, it affects other management practices such as tillage, uh, when we plan more related to the seed uh, placement and, and, and um, soil to seed contact, uh, compaction of the soil, which we want to avoid, and then also um, in our application. All right, so let's uh, start with soil temperature. If I go the right way. So we know that there is an optimum uh, soil temperature for germination. Uh, most seeds uh, in general germinate uh, best when the soil temperature is between 68 degrees and 86. And again, this is soil temperature, not air temperature. Even though they like today, feels nice and warm. Uh, we know at night we're cooling, the soil is still uh, cooled off. Just as a reference, if you go to your basement right now, like I am in mine, uh, you'll notice I have a, uh, some kind of sweater on because it's about 60 degrees. So the ground is still holding to a lot of uh, cold. So the ground is pretty cold yet and we're not, we're not there. Um, so uh, as far as temperature, you can see here that on this table that it shows that there's a minimum temperature but what we should be more uh, shooting for targeting is that optimum range of temperature for the different crops. And it will vary a little bit by crop, but just so, so you have that idea. And so one of the issues with, with the soil temperature, if we plant when the soil is too cold, is that you'll have some seeds uh, germinating and others not germinated within the same row. And so you uh, have a less even stand. So it affects the evenness of the stand. So that's one thing uh that that uh affects that and to illustrate that uh you can see that in this this work it was a oldie but a goodie uh where they were looking at different soil temperature with different coverings so in here we're mainly going to focus on the temperature they are going from 70 degrees 64 80 72 and 77 but you can see just visually there um where the soil was at 64 degrees you can see sort of the stand there being uneven and it's actually in the field and the way they changed the temperature was with burying heat tape so that's uh, uh, how they came up with the different soil temperatures. Um, you can see with the 64 degrees that the stand is shorter uh, and less even, where when the soil was heated above 70 degrees and 80, for example, you can see that that corn plant is uh, looking at uh, much uh, vigorous, if you will. Uh, we have measured this year in the field as well. Uh, here's some data looking at two inches of depth in the row from Arlington and Lancaster. Uh, comparing different tillage system. And part of the reason we look at tillage is because of the residue on the surface can affect the solar radiation and the heat that gets put into the soil. Uh, but in the red line, you can see uh, that's denoting the no-till uh, in Arlington, which is where the soil is a little bit darker than Lancaster. Um, you can see that in the no-till, uh, that soil tends to be a little bit cooler. We saw that in several, several seasons in a row. Uh, eventually they sort of catch up to each other, but there might be a little bit of an effect uh, from, from that residue as far as the temperature itself, uh, which sort of translated to uh, the emergence of the canopy. He's just an example from a different year, but again, looking at the same setup where the chisel disc is in the blue and the red is the no-till, you can see sort of that emergence in, in sort of uh, what we think is driven by the temperature of the soil. In Lancaster, we see that sort of the rolls are flip-flop, that the no-till, the emergence is a little bit faster. But again, that soil, um, it's not as dark as the Arlington. So the Arlington soil is going to absorb uh, more, more uh, energy from, from the solar radiation from the sun than the Lancaster. So that's where we see here this interesting interplay that there are other factors that are affecting the, the temperature as well. Uh, we see that this varies also by year. Uh, this is a different year looking at the emergence as, as well. And so I guess the point here is that not two years are the same and not two sites are the same or even two fields are the same. 
Uh, I'm going to scroll through that. You just talk about uh, the, the yield for, for this type of uh, um, setup. So here we have is the data from the pictures I show you, the figures that I show you, looking at the canopy development and the, and the temperature of the soil, where we had this four tillage system, a chisel in the fall with a finisher in the fall, in the spring, uh, no till, uh, a strip till, and then in no tillage where we removed the stover, the corn stover was harvested in the in the fall to kind of create a different uh, surface coverage, but still no soil disturbance. And this is from the Arlington side. And what you see here within these two columns is the optimal, uh, the economic optimal nitrogen rate, uh, EONR, and then the uh, yield at EONR. And what you see here is that the yield for the chisel at Arlington, and this is a five-year average for that for that work, um, was the highest followed by the no-till with no stover. So kind of leads us to believe that there could be some temperature, maybe nitrogen mineralization type setup happening, happening there. If you look at the EONR, uh, the chisel finisher had the lowest EONR uh, at this site for the five-year average, uh, followed by the no-till, interestingly enough, and then um, strip till, and lastly, the no-till uh, with no, no stover. If we were to look at this a little bit different, I guess, just looking at sort of thinking about nitrogen rates, uh, what I just showed you here at the bottom of this figure, it's again for Arlington. And what we're looking at is the agronomic maximum uh, or, or the nitrogen rate for the agro agronomic maximum yield. Um, and then the yield at that agronomic maximum yield. So what we see here, if we're looking now between the EONR versus the agronomic maximum is that to get you, for example, in Arlington, uh, just an increase of 26 bushels, you have to increase that nitrogen rate by 140 pounds. So you get a lot less bang for the buck. And so if you look at the other uh, tillage uh, treatments within the same site, we see the same thing that that additional nitrogen, uh, you see this diminishing returns so is something to keep in mind. So it's not just the temperature, there's other things going on too. At the Lancaster site, we saw a similar, a similar scenario. Uh, but we see things are, are shifted a little bit uh, where strip till uh, was, was uh, um, one of the highest yielding in the no-till, no stover uh, and chisel uh, followed by the, uh, the chisel uh, treatment. And we see that the EONR rates are somewhat in par, on par with the Arlington, uh, but in general, uh, a little bit lower. And again, when we look at the agronomic maximum, we see that additional nitrogen really gets you uh, not that much bang for the buck. So there's something to keep in mind. And this is the sort of the principle of the MRTN, the maximum return to nitrogen, where it takes into account the price of corn and nitrogen uh, for these same reasons. So looking at then uh, further into these details of the efficiency, here we have a partial factor productivity. You've seen how efficient the corn plant was. Uh, so how many uh, bushel of a corn per pound of nitrogen applied for the different nitrogen rates? And this is at Arlington for the different um, tillage system. We see that at uh, the uh, EONR range of 155 to 186, that that uh, PFP or partial factor productivity range between uh, 107 to 130. So sort of giving you that range of uh, how efficient that corn plant was. Uh, in Lancaster, uh, we see that that range of uh, PFP it's it's narrower, and the UNR you know it's a little bit on the on the lower uh, side compared to Arlington. But in San Joaquin, it gives you an idea that you know the different tillage systems, even though they might be having uh, some differences in soil temperature, they're performing uh, decently enough at these sites. Uh, so another issue that I mentioned uh, was nutrient availability and soil temperature. So we know that uh, soil respiration is affected by uh, temperature. So the activity of the microbes uh, chewing the carbon and releasing nitrogen and other nutrients. Um, and so we know that there's a same as a, as a seed for emergence, there is an optimal range for, for these. And so it varies if it's a microorganism over a macroorganism. So uh, earthworm versus a, a bacteria, for example. Uh, the other thing we know is that soil organic matter accumulates uh, at greater rates when the temperature of the soil is it's lower. Uh, and as the temperature of the soil increases, uh, the organic matter uh, decomposition increases. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And that's all driven by the respiration of the soil, which in turn, you know, when we're talking about mineralization, what the microbes are chewing is the organic matter and releasing nutrients from, from that organic matter. 
Um, and so the optimal temperature for nitrification is 90 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, although we can see some nitrification occurring between 50 and, and 32 degrees. And so the thing is that there's different microbial uh, communities that can perform in, in and be still active at different temperatures, and they might be performing the same activity than others. So they, they kind of share that in common. So how do we evaluate temperature? So if it's something important that we need to keep in mind, how do we assess it? So one way would be using products like this that you see here. This is from the runoff risk advisory. Uh, this is a screen, screen grab. You see that there's different tabs. One of the tabs there on the runoff risk advisory is the soil temperature. And then on the legend, you see the model soil temperature in, in ranges. And so this is for today. Uh, you can see that uh, most of the lower two thirds of the state, it's at 50 degrees or more on the top 10 inches of, 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 of the soil. And then you can forecast, you know, uh, four days down the road, as you see there in the bottom right. Um, so we see that, yeah, we're warmer, but, you know, things can cool, up, cool off, right? So it all depends on the forecast right now. So the, like um, Natasha was saying earlier, you know, we need to be keeping an eye on what the current conditions are. So this is one way, it's a broad aspect, right? It doesn't take into account the particular uh, specifics of, uh, of your fields and so on and so forth. So you could get a little bit more detail with products like this. This is from USGS at one of the Discovery Farm site where they do measure uh, soil temperature and it's posted online. The problem with this sometimes is that it doesn't get posted uh, frequently enough or early enough to be able to use it. To me, the best tool you could have is using a thermometer. This is just a meat thermometer. There's not such a thing as a soil thermometer. A soil thermometer, it's just a meat thermometer. It's just a thermometer, it's a thermometer. Um, so these you can buy at Walmart, Target, you know, Amazon, whoever you want to get it from. Again, this is just a meat thermometer. Insert into the ground. So usually what I do is put a piece of tape um, to mark the two inch or depending if I want to look, look at two inch or three inch and just insert it to that depth. Uh, these digital ones are pretty responsive. And so you can get a, a measurement like within a minute or two. And so you can go and check out your own fields uh, pretty easy and quick. You know, they're anywhere between $10, $15. Um, so pretty easy to do. All right, let's switch gears now and talk about uh, moisture, soil moisture. Um, so why do we concern ourselves with soil moisture? It's because it affects tillage. So a lot of us still do some tillage in the spring for various reasons. Uh, it also affects, I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, at planting because of the seed to soil, uh, soil contact and the performance of the um, um, planters that I think uh, Brian is going to talk about that here in a little bit. And so the optimum parameters for soil moisture are going to vary depending on the soil type and the management, right? So what tillage you're using, uh, if you have cover crops, uh, what residue might be present, what was the previous crop, so on and so forth. So I guess your mileage will vary and what uh, specifically you're gonna have to do will vary depending on this, this factor. So it's uh, to keep in mind. So again, to monitor, uh, we have things like this. It's a little bit more detailed than what I showed you for temperature here a second ago. This is a monitoring system uh, that is a co um, collaboration between NASA, George Mason University in Virginia and USDA NAS. NAS is the National Agricultural uh, Statistical Service. Uh, and this is called the Crop Condition of Soil Moisture Analytics uh, map. This is something new, uh, came online, I think, about two years ago now, uh, maybe a little bit less. There's a website, but you can see on the right, you know, has this legend that talks about the uh, uh, deviation from uh, normal or what is called an anomaly. So in Wisconsin right now, we're pretty close to normal, but, you know, there's some anomalies, especially if you go up in the, in the uh, northern part of the state where we're uh, uh, above as far as temperature a little bit. Um, but this is not very useful with this type of legend, right? So what other things are, but these can be used as a layer as you'll see here in a second that NAS, uh, USDA NAS uh, comes up with. Uh, this is again from the uh, run of risk advisory tool. Uh, there's another tab there looking at soil saturation. Uh, right now it's ranked the whole state as a as very dry, but again, there's different subtleties and the sensitivity of this uh, system might not be as high as others. It's just using data from uh, the National Weather Service and the National Weather Service is the one that models these moisture uh, parameters, but you can kind of see how uh, using the slide on the right, how to change with date. Maybe more useful would be something like this, like this monitoring soil moisture uh, product from the National Agricultural Statistical Service. 
um, where it looks at uh, suitable days for field work and in, in soil moisture. So it's not just looking at uh, conditions of uh, soil moisture. It looks at other things uh, for field work, planting, and other and other operations. And the legend you can see on the bottom, if, uh, if you cannot read that, it goes from brown to green, and it goes from uh, topsoil moisture from very short to surplus. Um, and so it's, a, it's kind of a general ranking, but it sort of gives you an idea of what's happening around the US. Again, you know, for purposes of doing some management in the field, uh, might not be as useful, but it's, it's something I want to highlight that uh, it's very difficult to do, but there's some data out there. And I think in the future, uh, we'll have something uh, even, even better than this. I know a lot of, lot of scientists, colleagues that are working on this type of work. So what do we go to? So similar to the salt thermometer, uh, you can you can do a hands-on method. In this case, uh, would be just using a field measurement assessment. And depending on your soil texture, you can kind of figure out uh, how that soil holds up, uh, how it consolidates and trying to figure out is it too wet or not. So I guess a take home message here is don't, don't be afraid um, to get your hands dirty and, and check your conditions uh, with boots on the ground. Another more expensive, fancier way of doing it is using a soil uh, moisture meter. This is from a company out of Illinois, not particular uh, referencing or advocating their, their equipment. It's just one that it's commonly available. Uh, but this is uh, another way of doing that. There's actually sensors out there that you can do this. I believe this sensor, it's about $600. They have a fancier version where you don't have to uh, bend down. So it just has a longer handle. Uh, and that one's a little bit more expensive, I think a little bit over $1,000, but there's different ways of doing it. The hand field method uh, works as well as two with some experience. So another issue, another thing that I like to talk about when we talk about moisture is that moisture affects the compactability of the soil. So the, the risk of compaction. And here in this figure, we have the density of the soil on the vertical axis. So the higher the bulk density values, I mean, the soil is compacted. And then on the bottom axis, we have the water content of the soil for three, and this is for three different tillage systems. Um, but what we see is that uh, as more, as we disturb the soil more, that soil tends to be more susceptible to compaction. And obviously as we increase the moisture of the soil, uh, the soil tends to have a greater risk for compaction until we reach a point where the soil is too saturated and, and there's different, um, um, forces at, at play there that we won't get into detail in this presentation. Uh, but if you'd like to know more, just feel free to contact me or look at some of the materials I'll share with you uh, here at the end of the presentation. So we also know that compaction and the moisture affects nitrogen losses, uh, same as the availability. So here, what we have is a figure illustrating that. So on the bottom, we have the density of the soil. So increasing density from left to right. And then in the different ba uh, color bars, we have the, if you will, the water content of the soil is the water field porosity. So how much water is in the pores of the soil? So going from 60 to 75%. Uh, and then the vertical is just the total nitrogen loss. And so what you see here in general is that as the water content of the soil increases, our nitrogen losses increases. And also as the compaction of the soil or the density of the soil increases, it also, the nitrogen losses of the soil increase. Uh, and this is due to denitrification process that we know it's an anaerobic uh, process. So uh, it occurs in the, during a lack of oxygen in the soil. Similarly, when we have uh, the density of the soil increase, the porosity of the soil increases. And in this case, we have uh, soil respiration here. So the activity of the microbes, some other microbes actually goes down. Uh, CO2 breakdown, it's more uh, uh, of an aerobic process or requires oxygen. So if the soil is saturated, you're going to have less soil respiration. If you have less porosity in the soil and smaller pores, you're also going to have less uh, respiration. So uh, what I'm trying to do with this is, is bring to the forefront or, or highlight that um, the porosity, compaction of the soil, all these things affect the health and how the soil functions for us. Uh, the last but not least, uh, another thing to keep in mind is uh, related to soil moisture, it's uh, manure application. So we obviously don't want to be applying manure in fields that are uh, too wet because the risk of uh, runoff are greater and uh, losing that phosphorus and that manure to the environment, it's a greater risk during those conditions. And that is the purpose of the runoff risk advisory forecast tool, um, as you see here. 
and again, you have a forecasting tool, a slider to, to look into the future a few days. So in closing, uh, what I would like to reiterate is that soil temperature and moisture conditions affect uh, agronomic and soil and other factors. Uh, there's some products out there, uh, like these maps that I show you with remote sensing or modeling that could be useful. Uh, however, you know, each farm and field is different. And so I think boots on the ground, it's, it's the best assessment that you can do. Um, and uh, yeah, we have some tools. Uh, some of them are relatively inexpensive, like a salt thermometer, but uh, for soil moisture, for example, that uh, tends to be a little more pricey, unless you're a, a crop consultant or something that you will use it a lot and, and, and get some uh, mileage out of it. The qualitative assessments are can work just as good. You just require a little bit more uh, experience and training, but uh, you can get there pretty quickly. Uh, finally, I want to highlight uh, here a few publications related more to compactions. You can see there uh, A4158, 4144, and 4181, uh, looking at different compaction uh, issues. Um, some of these, like I mentioned earlier, done in collaboration with Brian Luck that you'll hear from here in a second, but talking about something different, not compaction. And there's a couple of videos on, on use of a penetrometer and, and different tools uh, for compaction measurement. And with that, I hope that we have some uh, time for questions, Natasha, if there are any. Yeah, great, Francisco. Thank you so much. We do have a couple minutes. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, that they could put in that they would like to ask? Please put them in the chat. And if you want to put them in the chat, if you think of them later, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stay on and I can answer them through the chat as well. So we can go that route too. Great, thank you. All right. If not, thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us, uh, Dr. Ariaga. With that, we will now hear from Dr. Brian Luck, UW-Madison Professor and Extension Specialist of Biological Systems Engineering, uh, who you will be discussing planner upgrades and setup for optimized emergence today. So that, thank you, Dr. Luck. Thank you, Natasha. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and preface all of this by saying that I was enjoying a sinus infection this weekend. So please forgive me for not being my normal bubbly self, um, but we're going to get through this. If I can get my slides to advance. Okay. Um, so Sam asked me to do this and, and I think this crew probably has heard enough about the closing wheels and the down pressures and everything else. Um, I've been talking about that for a few years. So sort of backed off of that a little bit on this presentation. And, and I'm hoping based on what Francisco said, I, I shoved the thermometer in my yard the other day and it was still below 50 uh, in the top two inches. So um, I'm hoping planters aren't quite rolling yet, although there's a few of us risk uh, less risk averse folks that uh, may be going out and putting either soybean or corn in the ground. Uh, but what I did want to talk to you about today is I'm, I'm just walking through some planter checks and other things that we should do before we take the planter to the field, then what we should do when we take the planter to the field. Uh, and then I have a few research ideas at the back end of this that I wanted to share and maybe get some feedback on eventually uh, if you have any uh, questions or concerns about that. So the first thing I'll tell you when you're working on a planter, uh, Pay attention to which side of it, which side of the row unit you're on if you're taking things off. So there are left handed threads all over that thing. <clears throat> and if you choose to hand a graduate student an impact wrench and say, get that off of there without mentioning that the threads might be left handed, um, they will make you a pretty smooth bolt with no threads on it after the fact. So just a fair warning thing there uh, that if you are working on your planters, make sure there's a uh, there's a knowledge of the left hand side has left hand threads so they don't loosen off or running through the field. The other thing I would be remiss if I didn't mention is safety while working on machinery. So I used to have a, a couple of pictures in here. I've since taken them out of you know changing the the wheel and tire on a on a sprayer 
where they have six to eight blocks stacked one right on top of the other. And then a bottle jack is how they lifted the machine. Um, it's kind of like, that's not how we do that. So a couple of things to consider. You want to make sure you can lock out the hydraulics if possible, or make sure they're in a, a resting state to where they can't extend on their own if a, if a leak does happen to occur. Uh, you want to block up the plant in the row units. We we take our planter out and plant with it every year and do many, many, you know, uh, front coulter changes, closing wheel changes, things like that. You just always want to make sure you block it up enough that if your leg is under it, it won't come all the way down through your leg. Um, <clears throat> don't get under it if it's not mechanically supported. You can work on side of things without getting under, getting with blocks and stuff underneath it, uh, but just make sure you don't do that. Sharp parts on a planter, you wouldn't think running through the soil. Everybody tells you that soil dulls everything, uh, but honestly, I, I think my row cleaners and double disc openers get sharper every year. So I would say gloves and, and ideally long sleeves are, are a good idea. And honestly, accidents happen when you least expect them. So I've said this a million times. I'll be just be under there a second. And that second could have been the wrong one. So just make sure you're doing that. I won't spend too much time here. Um, but just to go through terminology really quickly, and, and I've, I'm sure I've been through this before, but really quickly, we'll go through it. Uh, of the front there, touching the soil is our row cleaners. Um, I say this every time, but I do question why they have row cleaners in this image due to the fact that it looks to be heavily tilled. Um, and we have a no-till coulter or a front coulter behind that. Double disc opener, gauge wheels. Between the double disc opener, you have your seed tube. A lot of times we have seed firmers. Uh, behind that, a lot of times there'll be starter fertilizer, uh, either in furrow or two by two. And then insecticide box on the back run and insecticide in furrow. And then towards the back is closing wheels. Moving up through, you know, you have your seed uh, seed metering device, depending on how that's driven. Could be electric, could be hydraulic, could be uh, ground driven with uh, mechanical chains and gears, or sorry, sprockets. To use the right terminology, Brian. Uh, four links, and then up to our down pressure, either springs or hydraulic or pneumatic systems, uh, with a seed box on top. At least this is the way this planter is set up. There's other different <clears throat> setups out there with central fill seating, um, but generally everything be beyond that is the same across the board uh, with most planters, regardless of your uh, favorite machinery color, I guess I'll say. So I'm just going to go through a few things here. Um, I, I may move us along a little more quickly in some points than not, but there are um, the one thing that I did find online, and it's I put the link there. It's pretty easy to Google if you want to go look at it. Is um, it's a Yetter Equipment Generic Guide for Planner Setup, and I find that I found that really useful when I first got my planner and started setting it up for the field season, because um, it gives a lot of good information there. So there's quite a few stuff to check. Uh, you always want to do that proper lubrication everywhere, um, and then there are wear components built into these machines. Um, I, I, I paused there because I was thinking, you know, that we're building machines to a price point to some extent. So they, they don't, they could make them bulletproof. Um, but I don't think we want to pay that cost. So making sure the wear components, we know where they are and then how to check and see if they're overly worn is another thing. Um, and I went through every bit of that backwards, but check your owner's manual is, is the first thing I'll say here. So making sure that you understand um, how to set things up and where to look and where to grease and where to oil and where to dry lube and everything is, is gonna be in an owner's manual um, or contact your dealership about that. So starting at the top, you know, well, it kind of jumps around a bit. So I won't say starting at the top, but when we talk about the parallel link arms, there's a setup associated with those, but when you go through and check them, you want to ensure the bolts are tight and torque specifications. A lot of times they have lock nuts on them uh, in the effort to let them not work loose. Um, that does not mean they won't work loose. I've had a set do that on me and, and drop off in the field. So um, before you go to the field, putting a wrench on everything, just making sure it's relatively tight is a good thing. 
The other thing I do with mine is is once it's mounted to a machine or somewhere safe, um, once it's up in the air, I grab a hold of each row unit and move it side to side. I, we're going around turns and, and there's a really no way to make sure that movement isn't going to happen. It would be what would be great if we were moving in a straight line all the time with those four links, but we aren't. Um, so you're going to have some side to side movement. You'll know when it becomes excessive. Um, in my opinion, if it, you know, if it's moving more than two to three inches, you might start looking at the bushings and bearing, well, bushings uh, within that system and see how much wear those have on them. Um, they're pretty, pretty small, easy parts either to make or uh, purchase and replace. So pretty easy situation to, to get up, get taken care of. Um, the other thing you want to make sure they're not bent or binding. You want your uh, row unit to be running level uh, side to side on both gauge wheels uh, and pulling through the field. And <clears throat> I guess the term we use in the planter world is, is having good planter row unit ride. So if you're leaning on one gauge wheel more than the other, leaning to one side, you know, all of those create issues with seed, pla seed placement, uh, and we don't want that. Seed tubes are pretty easy check. They're usually plastic, um, so make sure they're there. Uh, and make sure that they're not broken. Um, you want to make sure the seed is going down a tube and getting directed into the furrow instead of just getting shot out of the uh, metering device and onto the ground. And then there is a seed function, seed sensor in most of them. So you want to check functionality, uh, try running seed through or dropping seed through and see if you see a tick on the monitor that that uh, seed, seed sensor is working. Double disc openers are one of the more important things, I think. You want them to work well. You want them to cut through, in no-till especially, you want them to cut through residue, but I still want a nice uh, furrow in tilled soil as well. So I would get these. Um, and do this check every year at least. And I might even check them sometime during the season to make sure wear is not excessive. Uh, the way the most manuals read, they should have about two inches of contact at the soil engagement location. Uh, soil engagement would be about eight, seven or eight o'clock on a clock face if you're standing on the left, left side of the planter. Uh, so lower left is where it's gonna hit about 45 degrees away from the axle. Uh, you need those to be touching a, uh, two inches right there, two inches uh, plus or minus probably a quarter of an inch, half an inch maybe, um, because that's going to allow you to, to actually cut through the soil rather than, you know, cutting two grooves and possibly picking up uh, debris from the soil, debris from the field and, and messing up your double disc openers. Good way to check it is if you have a business card, a couple pieces of paper, uh, you should not be able to shove the pieces of paper together you push them in there and the gap between them should be about two inches linearly. Um, there are shims available, obviously, and overworn blades will not achieve that two inches of contact and they won't cut a furrow as well as you'd like them to. <clears throat> if your bearings aren't sealed, you wanna lubricate them. And again, this is where this happened to me. Uh, left-hand side of the planter is left-hand threads. And uh, if you turn it to the right with the proper air gun, you will not have a thread anymore. Couple of things on the gauge wheels and, and seed boxes. Um, one of the biggest things for gauge wheels is making sure they're engaging the double disc opener uh, blade properly. You don't want there to be a gap between the gauge wheel and uh, the double disc opener due to the fact that you pick up trash. It'll make your gauge wheel stick in a position and then your planting depth could be thrown off by that, either planting too shallow or too, uh, too deeply. So making sure that adjustment is set correctly where they're touching <clears throat> touching the double disc opener, but not touching so hard that they don't move relatively freely up and down as you set the planter in the ground um, and making sure they, they can do their job and set your seating depth well. Um, there are bearings. I think most of them in the center have needle bearings. Uh, and then um, it's just grease, grease point up by the... Uh, the actuation point where you adjust the in and out. So checking the bearings, make sure the bearings are present and exist, and maybe they need a little lubrication before you put the bolt back in is a good idea. Seed boxes, not too much to talk about there, other than the fact that clean them out good. Um, <clears throat> you don't want foreign material getting down into your seed meter and cracks and broken parts could cause problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. The one other thing I'll mention here too is um, I say it kind of as a joke, but a lesson I learned a couple of times 
is when you haul a planter that doesn't have central fill and has seed boxes on it. If you are hauling it down the road, and I wouldn't even say trailering it, just going down the road, <clears throat> I would make sure and take the lids off and either put them in there or put a piece of tape or strap around them uh, because the wind will take them. And then it's it's kind of a booger retracing your steps to find them, especially when you're going to Arlington, the Nash, uh, Arlington, the Marshfield. Um, I had to buy some new seed box tops, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, closing wheels, again, there's bearings in there. Usually the bearings are within the wheel. Uh, could be a needle bearing, could be a ball bearing, depending on what kind of closing wheel you're using. Definitely uh, double check those. If they're sealed bearings, there's nothing to do. Um, if they're shielded, they need to be cleaned out and checked and lubricated. They wouldn't be shielded in this case. I can't imagine putting a shielded bearing back there, but yeah, you know, stranger things have happened. Engineers do funny things sometimes. Um, also check the pivot bushings back there on the closing wheels and make sure they're not overly worn. <clears throat> this this happened to me on my planter um, right off the bat. I bought a Deer 7000 series and four row and I went back to the closing wheels and I can move the closing wheels probably two, two and a half inches uh, total movement across the back. And so there are just little pivot bushings in there that the bolts go through. That's what kind of keeps it in line and those needed to be replaced. So we had a pretty stiff uh, situation there. Seed meters, uh, just another cleanliness thing. You know, fig finger meters have springs and moving parts that must be checked, cleaned, and I think lubricated, but I don't know what kind of lube you want to use. I wouldn't use a liquid in that sense. I think a dry lube would probably be better in that case. And um, I think we probably dumped the graphite in sort of for that reason in some cases. Vacuum or pressure meters uh, need to be checked and cleaned as well, especially your vacuum fan. Make sure there's no rat's nests or uh, other animal damage uh, throughout that system and make sure you're able to pull um, five to 10 inches of water with that vacuum system uh, with the seed plates loaded. Not telling you where to set it. Mine usually likes to run at about seven and a half uh, on a four row with um, the system I'm doing, uh, but it should be able to be between five and 10 inches of water uh, in the field, holding those seeds to that plate and then dropping them efficiently. If you're running with chain shafts and transmissions, again, you know, it's, it's all check everything for tightness, proper adjustment, any bearings. Uh, worn out chains are the biggest problem I see or I've heard about. Um, they just slip over the sprockets and a lot of times the, the translation of power to the planter doesn't happen. Always lubricate this system. You need to keep your chains lubricated and your sprockets lubricated to make sure everything works properly um, and replace chains as, as they wear. <clears throat> sprockets as well, for that matter. Um, and then the row cleaners and front cultures, again, bearings, make sure they're not wobbling around and check for wear on those. Um, and I think we'll get into setup here in a minute, so I'll leave that for now. So in that Yetter um, guide, the generic guide I sent out, or I shared with you earlier, there's the link again. Um, they do talk about planter leveling, and I do think it is something we really should pay attention to, pay as much attention to as we can. Uh, if, regardless of how your planter runs, your seeding depth, once you get it set, won't change. Everything's going to kind of pull through the ground <clears throat> um, on a level basis. The issue you run into is engagement of some of your parts. So you might be getting more engagement on your front. Um, Front coulter, you might get less pressure on your gauge wheels because you're kind of leaning forward and then your closing wheels may just be skimming um, and not, you know, you may have to add excess down pressure there uh, to get them on the ground. And looking at it from another standpoint, leaning forward versus leaning back, same thing here. They are kind of pointing out that you can plant at different uh, depths in that case. The other thing to think about is when the planter uh, row unit is not sitting level, then your seed drop changes. Your seed may be hitting uh, the seed tube as it comes out of your meter, and that could adjust your seed spacing out the back as well, which is another thing we really want to avoid. Um, so obviously, double check and make sure everything's level. Um, and then the other thing that's really important that I, uh, on my three-point planter that I have to work on sort of every year is getting that depth, uh, lowering the planter to the right depth on the three point 
making sure it's level at that point. So my parallel arms generally start out um, when the planter gets in the ground being square, uh, parallel to the ground. <clears throat> that way everything's kind of level, sitting straight, and then any adjustment those arms need to make, they have room to actuate in both directions uh, with the downforce systems or springs or whatever uh, to accommodate changes in field conditions or terrain or whatever's going on. So as far as setup goes, once we get to the field, I'll spend a few minutes on these slides. I think I'm coming into uh, maybe a little bit ahead of schedule here, but I don't think anybody's going to get mad at me with the pretty day we have. So row cleaners, um, you just want to set them to where they're skimming. They're not supposed to do tillage. Now, that said, they can do tillage. One of the things that happens is we create a furrow and then plant into that furrow. Our seeding depth might be wrong at that point if we do that. <clears throat> because our gauge wheels are running on the soil that those row cleaners threw out to the side. So it's actually planting a little higher uh, than what we might actually want. And also you may create a trough for water to move through or move into, collect in, could be a problem. So make sure they're just skimming. Uh, the other thing <clears throat> is you wanna keep an eye on those as your soil conditions change. If the soil's drying out while planting, et cetera, um, and they may either engage more or less depending on your downforce and what's going on with that. Um, so just keep an eye on them and make sure they're adjusted to where they're just skimming, barely moving any soil, but definitely moving residue if you're in a no-till situation. Front coulters are, are pretty easy. There's not a lot of changes you can make to them necessarily. There's no adjustments that I know about, or at least the set that I have doesn't have any adjustment. They should be set to about one inch shallower than planting depth. You don't want them cutting the full furrow and then the double disc openers just opening. You want those double disc openers cutting the bottom of that furrow uh, to make a good V a spot for the seed to land. Um, they do cause additional draft force, not so much that you'd probably notice it, but it is there. Uh, and then it, they do um, allow for additional downforce. So if you're running front coulters in a no-till situation versus not, your downforce may change. Um, a little bit depending on how that goes, but not, not a great deal. Um, technology checks. So if you're running a 2020 or an in-command or um, I forget the rest of the names, but there's a lot of them out there. Um, you want to make sure you update, update everything in the spring, I think is generally the most recommended. Um, you can do it annually but I think usually everybody pushes out their updates in the spring, usually well before planting time. Um, always check wiring and connections, make sure every, the way I do this is I make sure every light that's supposed to be blinking is blinking on the planter, on the tractor, on the GPS, et cetera. Um, chewed wires are sometimes an issue. And also they can be real hard to track down. So the, the wire coatings we use today are soybean based um, and animals really, really do like to eat it. I had one, uh, this asked me how I know is I had one get through a uh, an injector wire on my pickup and that was a booger to figure out. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't run real good when you have that happen too. Um, most monitors have a calibration mode to send, spin the seed plates. If it doesn't have a calibration mode, a lot of times you can trick Trick it the way uh, the way we do it is I have a little plug that I made the built built into my planter to make it think the planter's in the ground, um, and then I can tell my monitor that I'm moving five miles an hour, um, and then we catch the seed coming out of the seed plate <clears throat> just to make sure that if I want to plant forty thousand seeds of corn per acre or one hundred and forty thousand seeds of soybeans per acre, um, I can time it for fifteen seconds and make sure that number is pretty well accurate. Um, Within that system too, depending on the voltages and other things that are going on, sometimes my motors, um, you're running electric motors on my planter seem like they spin a little faster or slower, um, depending on the situation, RPMs, et cetera. So that is one thing that I have adjusted and, and played with the number of holes that it the system thinks is in the seed plate uh, to bump that up forward or backwards just a little bit. Um, to hit my seeding rate. I think planting depth is one of the uh, one of the most thing most important things when we're talking about getting this done. Um, 
and and with that comes what Dr. Ariaga mentioned about the soil and the moisture and everything going on while we're at planting. You want to hit that depth so the seed is in the moisture and able to emerge uniformly <clears throat> once we get up to the right temperature. Um, but long story short, is the function of the gauge wheel is to maintain that row unit on the ground, but not push the gauge wheel into the ground. You want it riding on the ground up against all its stops so that the double disc opener is cutting at a very accurate depth what we want to, what we want to see and what we want to maintain during planting. I always recommend making test passes <clears throat> on your border rows or whatever you can do. Get out there and get the planter in the ground, get the planter up to speed before you start digging in that row and making sure that um, it's planting at the depth you want it to. Heavier soils generally require more pressure to keep the row unit in contact with the soil. Um, the way the dynamics of that row unit planter tractor works is generally it's always wanting to ride up out of the soil. Um, if it's taking a constant load from the soil going over the different coulters, double disc openers, et cetera, closing wheels as well. Um, so the function of that down pressure spring or down pressure uh, hydraulic system, pneumatic system is to keep it pinned to the ground, but you don't want to keep it so pinned to the ground that you're starting to see tracks where your gauge wheels run. I think that's too much. Um, the other thing I will mention that if you are using a planter with planter boxes, um, over time, as you plant that seed out and your boxes get empty, the row units start to lose weight and your downforce requirements may need to change. Um, if you have springs, I'm not sure it'd be a full step on the spring, uh, but I would check to make sure you're achieving the depth that you want to and might be adjusting that, um, that depth a little bit as you lose weight on your seed boxes. With seed spacing, Basically, that, that was my job as a kid. Dad would plant a pass, and then he'd send me out there to dig. Um, but I would dig multiple locations across the planter, ensure every, every row unit's doing what it's supposed to, um, and then check the monitor in the cab as well, make sure every, everything agrees before you plant an entire field You know, with, with um, improper spacing. That would be a bad, bad deal. <clears throat> my cold's holding me up. I apologize for that. Um, finally, I'm going to run through a few things here, but overall goals, you've seen this before, plant at the right depth, uh, cover the seed, close the furrow. We want to get seed to soil contact and have uniform emergence as the goal, okay? I think most people have seen this, but I'll talk you through it really quickly. What we're using in our um, simulated producer trials is what I'm calling them. It's, it's not, a, uh, not an Almeco typical agronomist type plot planner, we're using a proper uh, planner with a, what farmers would use. So it's a Maximerge 2 with vacuum row units. We're using Ag Leader, uh, field computer and electric seed plate drives. And I did have to add the generator to run those seed plate drives. Um, you would probably have to do this for any planner uh, because the alternator on the tractor <clears throat> can only put out so much current and having that generator available allows it to, uh, to not have to work so hard. We're using a few Dawn equipment things with their hydraulic downforce, variable depth control, and very closing, variable closing wheel depth uh, and pressure. And we plant at five miles an hour with guidance. Running up on time, so I won't belabor this too much, but there's an old picture of my planter. Uh, this is still when we had manual depth and manual gauge wheel control. Um, and again, I've talked about, I'm sure this group has heard about the, uh, the steel plates in the planter. So I won't waste our time there. This is a little closer view. I think we took this picture last year um, of the planter. So you can see uh, it's got its automatic depth control. It's controlled hydraulically there. No more T handles to move the depth up and down. Um, and then we also have the gauge wheel um, stuff on the back, which is pneumatic, pushing down on those. And then the depth control off of that is run off of that um, wheel in front of the gauge wheels. So that's technically a seed firmer. But what it really does is it finds the bottom of the furrow and adjusts those gauge wheels up and down to make sure you're not throwing seed out of the furrow <coughs> with the gauge wheels, which is a pretty neat system, by the way. So wrapping up here, I got a couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, we're going to be spending some time this summer working with a sprayer drone. We got a, a DJI Agris T40 heading this way. So Dr. Conley, Worley, and Smith and I are working on this. 
test effectiveness in soybeans and fungicides and herbicides, uh, looking at cover crop spreading. I want to see uh, machinery field capacity, so acres per hour, how, how well can they do? Uh, and then the other thing is we're measuring air velocity and, and magnitude and direction uh, within the canopy as those fly over. So I want to I want to measure in corn and soybeans sort of how much downdraft we're getting and how much um, of that spray are we blowing down into the canopy that might be benefiting or hurting, depending on whether it needs to be on a leaf or not. Um, <clears throat> there's another situation here, too, with uh, I don't have any funding to do this, so we're kind of bouncing ideas to look at it, but seed firmers. So I know there's not a lot of selection out there on seed firmers, but the I will say, and I'll show you in a minute, the difference between that wheel type I have on my planter versus a Keaton or other thing um, is night and day difference. So, and then the other thing is I'm I'm going to start pushing towards doing some of this planter technology stuff in soybeans. There's been a lot of rumbling about everybody's investigated closing wheels and down pressure and everything in corn. And what about soybeans? So I think I'm going to try to drag a few of my colleagues, maybe Dr. Ariaga, into that one too. I really want to measure sidewall compaction, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. So there's the updated picture of the planter and some uh, what I'll call mildly heavy residue uh, that we rolled down and crimped and then planted through. Uh, we had row, this was we were planting corn here, so we had row cleaners down on the left too, and no row cleaners on the right. Um, if you're wondering why it looks like that, <clears throat> but here's the picture of the seed furrow. <clears throat> um, and I'm not I'm not going to say the right is without those seed firmers because everything was planted with the seed firmer. Uh, but I believe that's just seed that jumped out of the furrow or got thrown out of the furrow. What I want you to pay attention to is the left here uh, where we put those seeds in with that wheel type press uh, seed firmer. <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you, in Arlington soils and Marshfield soils both, um, with my little seed digging tool, most of those you have to pry out. So they are pushed in there very well. The question I have about that is how much seed firming pressure is too much. Am I causing a problem with those seeds because I have them firmed in there too hard uh, and the little roots and, and leaves and stuff are having a hard time coming out? So I think that's an interesting question and, and something we might look into in the future. Every talk I give in Wisconsin, I got to mention agribility. So there it is. I'll leave it on the slides. Um, you know, anybody with a disability that wants to farm or that is farming, uh, we have opportunities to help them. And with that, I filled my time and we'll be here for any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Luck. So before we get to questions, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, as Jerry and Richard have demonstrated for us in the chat, we uh, do have